place. Jesus, you are the door. Move every chill and every shackle. Are you fight me buckle? Please take me to your top and knuckle, God. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our joint women and men's missionary fellowship meeting. So happy to have you here with us, those in the sanctuary, as well as those online. I'm Andrea Goldson Barnaby, the president of the Women's Missionary Fellowship here at Portmore Gospel Assembly. We want to welcome those who are joining for the first time. If you're joining for the first time, please let us know in the chat. All right. And also a special welcome to Dr. Patrick Gordon, our guest speaker. So let's stand as we open in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. We thank you for the opportunity to meet together once again in your presence, to fellowship, to learn more about you and matters regarding health. Lord, we just commit this meeting to you, and we pray that you lead and direct, and that at the end of the meeting, we would have been edified. Thanks again for your many blessings, and continue to lead and direct us. All these mercy I ask through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Just some announcement highlights for the women. Remember that July 31st will be our Women's Sunday. And we'll also be having a virtual concert in the evening. Remember, we need you to submit your songs, your pre-recorded songs for the concert as soon as possible, right? And we need items from each of the houses. So Blue Diamond, Lydia Roses, please remember to send your items to either myself or Sister Tara Smith Palmer, the president of the Women's Missionary Fellowship for the Associated Gospel Assemblies, right? So reminder, July 31st, we have our Women's Sunday when the women will be in charge. Remember to wear red. Red is the color in the morning. And then in the evening, we have our virtual concert and we need our items, your items as soon as possible as well. Even though it's online, we are still asking for you to give a contribution to the AGA Women's Missionary Fellowship right so we are still asking the suggested contribution is 500 jamaican dollars but we will you know receive whatever you're able to give to con so that we can continue with our various initiatives all right so that's the the main announcement highlight we had some other ladies coming in the sanctuary welcome happy that you could join us all right so we have two songs that I'm going to ask the multimedia team to play for me. After which we will have our scripture reading, which will be led by Brother Barkison.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, our scripture reading is taken from 3rd John, and we'll be reading from 1 through 6. Reading. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. Sixth and last, they have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. Here ends a portion of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Good evening, everyone. Here we'll talk about some fun facts about health. Fun health facts. Laughing 100 times is really equivalent to 15 minutes of exercise on a stationary bike. There are more bacteria in your mouth than there are people in the world. You, you burn more calories sleeping than you do watching television. 
right-handed people live on average nine years longer than left-handed people. You are about one centimeter taller in the morning than in the evening. During your lifetime, you will eat about 30,000 kilograms of food. That's the weight of about six African elephants. In some parts of the world, one being Malaysia, parents protect their parent, their babies from disease by bathing them in beer. Extreme music, such as heavy metal, can positively influence those experiencing anger. It's not just coughs and sneezes that spread diseases. One single bacterial cell can multiply to become more than eight million cells in less than 24 hours. Joining clubs after retirement could extend your life. Bring on knitting and book club. When you sneeze, your body is getting rid of infected cells and on average sneeze will spread over 100,000 viral cells up to nine meters. On average, adults catch two to three colds each year while school-aged children can have about 12 or more colds in one year. It is believed that the main purpose of eyebrows is to keep sweat out of your eyes. Smokers reduce their lifespan expectancy by 11 minutes, of, 11 minutes per cigarette. Of the 206 bones in the average human body, adult body, 106 are the hands and feet, 54 in the hands and 52 in the feet. Feeling down? Eating spinach, oysters and crab have become proven to positively impact your mood. Doctors who work at Australian Antarctic stations are required to have an appendix prior, removed prior to leaving. Motorists who talk on cell phones and more impaired than drunk drivers with blood alcohol levels exceeding 0 0.08. Banging your head against a wall burns 150 calories an hour. Not that we recommend this though. <laughs> Ever wondered why there are mirrors in front of a cardio section at the gym? Watching yourself run in a mirror can make a treadmill workout go by faster and feel easier. When we touch something, we send messages to our brain by 200 kilometers per hour. Think on those things. Thank you, Sister Nadine and Deacon Parkinson. Now we have a crowd, uh, crowd breaker for the houses. I don't know if all the houses are represented here, but there is a word, health, and I am going to give you between five to 10 minutes to come up with as much words that you can form from that word. And the house, of course, without the help of the internet or Google, I want you to tell me how many words you can form from the word health. And um, as I said, we'll give points based on the host that gives the most, the, the, the most responses. So the online audience, you can also be a part of this competition as well as those in the sanctuary. So we'll give how many minutes you want? Five minutes or ten minutes? Five minutes? Five minutes. So let me know how many words. If you need pen or paper, I have pen or paper. So you will be representing your house, Blue Diamond, Lydia Roses. Sister Mac, you're in a house? So you want to work with Sister Scott? You can work with Sister Scott. Remember, no Google, no internet. And if you need paper or pencils, I have.
Mr. Sababa, you can help me to keep track of the time, please. Sing this out. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God Come on, sing it out All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so sing of the goodness I love your voice you have led me through the fire and in darkest you are closer like no one see I've known you as a fire
wants to go first? Who found the most words? Blue diamond roses. I'm not sure how many houses are represented here. I know roses are here. So we can, can we get a representative to come up from each house to let us know the words that you found? And also, Babette, if there's anybody online, you can also let us know. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So Rose House found 17 words. These words are, please don't copy. <laughs> These words are heat, he, eat, the, hat, heel, have, tea, eight, hate, halt, tail, hail, let, late, teal, lost. Okay, the words we have uh, is he, heel, hat, eight, hail, half, heat, and e a t, eat, eight, late, laugh, let, ale, at, tea, the, that, tea. Eighteen. Eighteen words left. said that you can actually find 55 words unscrambled from the letters. So anybody online was able to beat that? So Sister Marcia, let me get my, my glasses out to see what Sister Marcia has. Heal, heat, hate, lit, teal, eight, eat, tea, let, hat, the, Ail, halt, and heal. So that's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen. So let me just write that down. Sister Marcia got fifteen. Roses got seventeen. And Sister Mac, you're not sure what house you're in. Sister Mac and Sister Scott. So we will have to assign you to a house. So let me tell you some of the words. You may not be familiar. I'm not familiar with some of these words. Or I can't even pronounce some of them. So you have ale, alt, eight, eat, elt, etta, hat, tea, the, a h is a, e a t h. H A E T, hail, halt, hate, hat, H -A, which is H A T H, heal, heat, late, and so on. But you can check it out on the internet now that we finished the competition. Thank you. Okay. So now I'll introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Patrick Garden completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Guyana and after two years went on to complete his master's degree at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Following that, he completed the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Manitoba. The area of research had to do with the synthesis of anti-cancer antibiotics. Patrick has worked both in industry and he's now in academia and thus brings three decades of experience from these sectors. 
He currently teaches at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston for the last 13 years. He's currently doing research at the University of the West Indies, and he will be here with us until August. He has been a career consultant and coach, and he has conducted many workshops over the last 15 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Garden. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrea, for that kind introduction. And uh, welcome, and thank you guys for um, allowing me the privilege to uh, communicate some thoughts with you uh, today. Uh, and it's my intention uh, to have a conversation, and but more importantly, to share some ideas that I've had, and, um, and, and hopefully it would be of um, use for you as you think about some of the issues that I might uh, raise in, in this talk. And, and my plan is to just go over some, some things that I've thought about over the years and, um, and share some lived experiences that would allow us to uh, think about some of the current issues at hand, uh, and some of them have to do with, with health. So can we have the first slide, please? I do want to first really thank Andrea for um, allowing me this, this opportunity and having some faith in me that I could communicate uh, some wisdom, uh, if you will. And, um, but I'm always reminded when I am um, asked to, to give a talk, I uh, most often think that I'm saying a lot of these things for myself because I think I need to be reminded of some of the things that I'm going to uh, talk to you today about. So um, as Andrea mentioned in, in, in the um, bio, I was going through uh, North Dakota with one of my colleagues. We were doing a workshop in uh, uh, New Mexico at the Los Alamos site. And we were traveling through South Dakota, which is a pretty um, sparse state. It's big, not a lot of um, homes, etc. And my colleague was sharing with me that his wife, my, so he has a PhD like I do, but his wife doesn't have a, a first degree. And he was telling me that um, oftentimes she feels that she's not um, qualified as him, she feels her self-confidence isn't there, etc. And I don't remember how I came to tell him what I did. And I said, you know, my parents never finished high school. Neither of my parents never finished high school. My dad was the eldest boy of eight children. My grandmother had uh, her first four children were twins, the twin girls, and then my dad and a twin sister. And his dad, father died when he was 15, so he had to go to the family. And my mom, um, back in the early 1930s in, in Guyana, you had to pay to go to high school. And there was a countrywide exam, which I believe you know, still exists in some sense throughout the Caribbean. Um, she scored higher than the woman who eventually became Minister of Education during my high school tenure. And in fact, um, some of you might know the name Winifred Gaskin because she actually did come to um, Jamaica as the ambassador to, to um, Jamaica representing Guyana um, during the, uh, I think, 80s. But she couldn't go to high school because ben then you had to pay. And my grandfather was was a carpenter, but he was also an alcoholic. And, and in fact, my mom uh, used to tell me that she had to go to the rum shops that they were known then. And imagine a girl of 12 or 13 years old going to the rum shop on a Friday to take the money out of my grandfather's pocket, else they wouldn't be eaten. So she never had a chance to go to high school. But I never thought that my parents weren't educated and so it helped me to realize that there's a difference between schooling and education 
And I think many uh, of you could relate to that is that you, the, uh, the educational opportunities or the schooling opportunities weren't always available, but it didn't mean that you didn't have an education. And in fact, um, we couldn't speak in proper English, etc., because my parents knew all of that. And I must have been about 16 or 17 when I recognized, because of the conversations I had with my mom, that uh, she hadn't finished high school. So. I said to my uh, friend that there's a difference between school and an education. And I think it's a reminder that many of us who haven't had some of the same opportunities, it doesn't mean that you're not educated. It just means you weren't schooled. And, um, and so I started to coin this phrase, thinking about thinking. And so if we can have, have the next slide, I will go on to give you some uh, thoughts. And when I was in high school, I loved literature, and it's still one of my favorite subjects, and every so often I um, pick up a, a play by Shakespeare because I did a couple of the plays um, for O-Levels. And this one is from Hamlet, and there's a quote that says, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And in that setting, they were not referring to the fact that Let's say if we think about something tragic that happens in our lives, like losing a loved one, those are always important events. What they were really saying is that we can look at events in a way that would either confer them to be good or bad. And so, for example, let's say if it rains and you're upset about the rain, well, it's neither good or bad, right? You just feel that it's not good for you. But guess what? For some people, the farmers, et cetera, they are welcome in the rain, right? Um, or let's say you miss a bus or a taxi. But guess what? You know, a couple hours later, something good might have happened. You're thinking that, gee, I missed this bus and it's really terrible, but there's something better down the road. So. That's what they were, uh, the authors were referring to. So this whole idea of thinking is really important. And as um, Deacon Dean said about you know, thinking about the fun facts, the, whole, the operative word there for me is thinking. So can we have the next slide, please? So what I want to do uh, in the minutes I have is to really uh, give you a framework that I, again, think about some of these issues. And I want to use. Uh, the headings information, knowledge, and belief. And so when we think about information, can I have the next slide, please? Um, I want to cite a couple of examples and then give you some other um, knowledgeable things that could help us to think um, more deeply, but also have a sense of once you have the knowledge that derives from the information, you're able to make better choices. So sickle cell, as many of you know, it's a very important disease because it affects more blacks than whites. And, um, and I have uh, close relatives who are uh, affected by that. And can I have the next slide, please? And I want to give you a little bit of information about um, sickle cell. Could we go to the next slide? Because I put some information in it. So what I want you to focus on is the fact where it says uh, the total number of amino acids in the protein hemoglobin that makes up the uh, protein for the sickle cell. And as they were challenged, illustrated, I think it was a timely um, act because it helps you to see that just with that word held of what, six or seven letters, you can generate 55 words. Well, when we think about the protein hemoglobin and the combination, you could arrange those amino acids in a way that would give you millions of different proteins, but it has to be a specific order. So can we have the next slide, please? And this is just really to get you to focus on the fact that when we look at the letters there, and those letters are just um, letters for the amino acids. And you can see that if you take one of those 
amino acids and puts it in a different position, what you have is a different protein. And if we go to the next slide, and this is where the sickle cell disease arises from because there is just one pro uh, amino acid that the gene that codes for that acid places a valine instead of a glutamic acid. Just one single amino acid. Now what that means is that the shape of the protein, which should be roughly circular, it's like a half moon, and hence the word sickle. And what that means is that the blood cannot carry as much iron, and that presents a cascade of problems as a person ages because you need more energy to do lots of things. Can we go to the next slide, please? The other issue surrounding health I want to just mention briefly is the pregnancy and the Irish factor. And um, go to the next slide, please. And again, this is just to give us some basic information. And the, the last uh, line there which says Irish negative. Most individuals are Irish positive. Ever so often you have an individual who is Irish negative, and it just means that there's a protein that is not present. And I happen to have had an aunt who had that situation. And she lost two babies before um, they finally decided that she was gonna have a transfusion, and I'll tell you a little more about that. But again, it just means that nature introduced an in perfect system and there was that situation that causes that difference. Can you go in the next slide please? And so I want to then now talk a little bit about uh, the COVID situation because again when we think about uh, the COVID virus, viruses are proteins much like bacteria and those proteins have a set of amino acids in a particular way. And one of the misconceptions is when we think about uh, vaccinations, for example, some of the platforms for the vaccine is that what the scientists have done is taken some of the protein, the amino acids within the protein, and make it a little different. So you cannot get the virus from that vaccine, but what it does is that the body looks at that protein and say, aha, this is a foreign protein, let me build up some antibodies. And so a lot of the technology is based on the fact that we now understand a lot more than we did 30, 40 years ago. And so here we've got information that the scientists now have translated into knowledge to, able, to be able to do some things today that weren't possible a long time ago. The next slide, please. And I threw this in this morning because I happened to have gone to um, the chapel service on campus and the gospel reading um, dealt with um, Naaman and his uh, affliction with leprosy and you know going into the Jordan. You guys know the story, right? But a lot of, um, if we go to the next slide please, a lot of people are not aware that leprosy is still present in our society and as the um, first bullet says you have almost um, you know 12 million cases every year and in fact the WHO has classified it as a neglected tropical disease and really it's not very contagious and when we think about the stigma regarding um, uh, the the, the information back in the biblical times, it was perceived much like with COVID, right? People are so scared, but you really can't get it uh, without direct uh, fluid contact, etc. But it's very curable uh, with, with, with uh, antibiotics. And um, today, uh, there's uh, many protocols that use what we call multiple drug therapy just because of the overuse of antibiotics, um, we have to, um, and the buildup of, of 
of resistance, and one of that has to do with certainly in, in, in the US and, and in many countries where the access to antibiotics aren't, uh, isn't um, good enough. What tends to happen is that, let's say, uh, and I can speak more about you know, the poorer communities in the states where, let's say you got a cold or an ear infection and you went and you got you know, a regimen of, of antibiotics, let's say if it's 15 days. What some people do is say, look, I'm gonna take it for seven days. They're feeling better already, but we're gonna save the other um, set of tablets for when you get sick again. But what you're doing there is really building up the resistance because the bacteria now are changing their profile and adding different amino acids to the protein structure and helps, hence making the um, antibiotic use the next time resistant. And so we really need to be cognizant of the fact that if your doctor says take this for two weeks, you have to take it for two weeks. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? And so with that information, we need now to go to the knowledge base. And the next slide. And so this is where, um, when we think about um, coming back to sickle cell anemia, in the US, the Food and Drug Administration just approves, approved within the last, I think, six or eight months, gene therapy. And what gene therapy is, in essence, is that because they know the information, and that is there's one misplaced amino acid, what they said, oh, okay, we're gonna go in and we will put the right gene because what the genes do is code for the placement of the right amino acid at the right time. And so individuals now go th through that gene therapy and there are about 47 cases, as far as I'm aware, who are individuals who have had the gene therapy. And what that means, it's a cure. Whereas before, you can do certain things to mitigate the symptoms. Here, they're going in and, impl and placing the, the right gene that codes for the right protein. And so with that information, when they have sequenced the, the protein, they know exactly what to do. And then um, I mentioned I would come back to the RH blood factor. So my aunt, um, who passed away actually a couple of months ago, she was in her 90s, she was a Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, a witness, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with that um, body of, of, of Christ. They do not believe in general in, in, in uh, blood transfusion. So she lost these first two babies because they refused to do a transfusion. And with the third child, the hospital then in Ghana, and so this would be probably in the late 40s, didn't give them a choice. So my cousin is li living today because of that intervention, and it turns out that she had a son who, when he was about eight, they knew he had, was born with, with a con congenital heart defect. He had to come to Jamaica at UWE to get um, that heart um, condition corrected, but they were told that he would have to have blood. And so he is alive today because the precedence was set that his mother is alive because the hospital intervened. And so again, I want to encourage us to think about sometimes when we hear or we have this belief that certain things aren't appropriate based maybe on scripture, etc. We have to be careful how we interpret some of those um, uh, words. And, and, and I believe that, you know, the Lord has given uh, people around us that ability to make uh, life better for us. And I think we have to, I think, appreciate uh, that. And then, uh, again, I, I alluded to a little bit about the uh, the COVID vaccine, the RNA technology. And so when individuals who are skeptical about the vaccines, they say, well, how come you can have this vaccine in six or eight months? Well, the fact of the matter is, scientists have been working on RNA technology for 10 or 12 years. It's not overnight. What really 
precipitated the rapidity in solving the problem is that many of those centers saw it fit to share information and say, look, we've got a worldwide problem. The only way we could at least arrest and combat this virus is to share information. And so there was more of a cooperative effort than before. And so a lot of that is because we're able to solve some of these problems based on RNA technology. And in fact, I'm sure in years to come, there are some particular diseases that are still um, a burden, and one of them is cystic fibrosis, which is a problem where the, the body doesn't have the right protein to clear the mucus from the lungs. So as an individual um, matures, breathing becomes a problem. And in fact, most individuals who um, suffer from cystic fibrosis don't live beyond their late teens, early 20s. And we actually, I have a, a, a good friend whose sister and husband lost two children to cystic fibrosis. They happened to have a, a, a child who that gene um, wasn't there. So, um, and the other disease that I can think of is Huntington's disease where, again, it's a, a misplaced gene but part of the problem is that you don't have a lot of people relative to some of the other diseases and based on the healthcare system, certainly in the States, that drives a lot of that um, solution for a cure, it's not financially rewarded. And so again, my hope is that the COVID uh, situation would allow um, the world to think about diseases in a different way where we can solve some of these other problems and leave the, the monies for some of the other issues that are going to arise that we really don't know how to solve. And so um, hopefully the, the, the stage would, would be set for us to think globally about some um, better ways to cooperate and, and solve some of these problems. Can I have the next slide, please? And so the, the last area I want to talk about is, is the whole issue about belief, because I think sometimes even when um, we have the knowledge, I think, and, 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 and you all here and online could, uh, I think, attest, there's a certain amount of, of belief that has to come into play. And, and I'll give you some examples of, of that to underscore the fact that I think I try to think about the fact that in spite of what you know, you still have to sometimes have that belief. And can I have the next slide, please? And I don't know if you can see all of this, but um, the first one says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I think one of the, I like to think about that from time to time because I think we don't often just even take that on face value because when you have the, the truth, at least for me, it gives me a measure of comfort. And so when you know, let's say, for example, that an individual or a family member has sickle cell disease, that knowledge tells you this is the truth and then it gives you at least some measure to say, okay, I could then take the individual or we can do these interventions to at least mitigate or solve the problem. And then um, some of the, one of the other um, pieces of information there is that I remember, and I don't exactly remember when, but somewhere when I was a teenager, my mother always used to quote Hebrews 11.1. 1. You know, faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. And I think, again, sometimes you, you want something or you desire something, but you don't know exactly how that is going to come about. And so you really just have to have the faith that it will come about. 
and, and you have to act in that way. And before I show, um, there are two um, clips I, 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 I want to show. I want to mention a couple of anecdotes, and they really don't um, mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, but I think for me, they are a reminder that when the stakes are higher, you really should have that um, same measure of belief. And, um, and the, example, the, the example is, um, because of my trips back and forth to the island over the last um, several months, it so happens that um, I usually fly with Delta Airlines and uh, because I've flown a lot over the last year or two, we ha I have this status that allows upgrades. Now, so I'm flying to uh, Maryland uh, back in April and I landed in Atlanta. No, I actually was going to uh, San Diego for the conference, the ACS conference, and I landed in Atlanta and it happened to have a snow, uh, uh, um, tornado and lightning storm. And so a lot of the flights were canceled. Um, now I'm on the upgrade list for first class. And I looked at the manifest and I'm, there's zero first class seats and I'm like number 17. That tells you that there's no chance. Right? So the hours go by and I'm seeing all these cancellations. The next thing I see there are two first class seats and I'm number 10. And three first class seats and then number four. By the time I'm ready to board, I was number one with five first class seats. But all the while I said, I'm gonna get on and I'm gonna get in first class. I didn't have any doubt. Now the facts said four hours ago that there was no chance. And I said, well, I might as well believe, right? Because it's just easy to believe as not to believe. Which one would you rather do? And, and so sometimes you have to have that belief. And the other example is similar, but it illustrates another thing that I have experienced, and, I, and I'll tell you why. I love to ask for favors, if you will. We were going to Richmond, Virginia. Same scenario, my wife and I were in first class and we were traveling with two of our boys. And there was one first class seat available. And I said to the flight attendant, could my son come up in first class? And she said, no, he didn't pay for the f thing. I went to the other flight attendant who was the lead flight attendant. And she said, I don't care. So he goes and he sits in first class. There's another guy whose fiance was in the coach and he wanted to sit with her. So he gives up his seat. And I go to her again and said, could he come, my other son come up? She said, sure. So we all flew first class. But here's, I think, the reason. You see, I used to shop with my mother going to the market. And we were not, you know, uh, we didn't have a lot of money. So my mother was always bargaining. And I saw a lot of that. So I have no compunction to say, you know, I'm going to give you $3 or $300. In fact, today I was at Papin Market buying our bread food. And she said, $400. I said, no, $300. And she said, okay. The thing to remember, though, is that when you do that, it must be a win-win situation. And I think the practice for me is that I could have paid $400 for the bread fruit or not flying first class. But you see, there are times when that comes, the stakes are higher and you need to ask. And I think if you don't have the habit of doing it when it really doesn't matter, when it does matter, you may not do it. And so I am always of the thought process that you should have that belief and that expectation that things will work out your way. And I know for a fact that I have gotten a lot of blessings because of my grandmother and my mother and the way they thought and the way they treated people. And there is no question that a lot of the circumstances that I have been blessed with, not really due to me, it's to my, my grandparents and my parents' fate. And so I think that is really the other lynching 
pinch that I want to uh, impart that you always have to have faith. So if we can play the first clip of the... Um, Can we get the sound? We're not hearing any sound. Now, hopefully, we can hear the sound. The, these are two. In this event in four decades. Can we turn it up? Games in Tokyo. When Billy Mills, a Native American from South Dakota. Can we? These are two clips of two athletes um, because I am a fond, um, a fervent. Um, follow of athletics because there's so many stories that allow us allow me to think and be expectant on uh, things that I would like to achieve. Any luck? Welcome back to the games of the 28th Olympiad. I'm Jeff. All right, well, at least I, um, if we can Lampley. hear. Coming up shortly, we'll have live coverage. We can hear the song, but we can't turn it up again. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. 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 Olympiad. I'm Jim Lampley. Coming up shortly, we'll have live coverage in its entirety of the men's 10,000 meter final, an event dominated in recent years by runners from Africa. The United States has not won a medal in this event you guys in hear? four decades, not since the 19th. Welcome back to the games of the 28th Olympiad. I'm Jim Lampley. Coming up shortly, we'll have live coverage in its entirety of the men's 10,000 meter final, an event dominated in recent years. Here's by runners from Africa. The United States has not won a medal in this event in four decades not since the 1964 games in Tokyo. When Billy Mills, a Native American from South Dakota, stunned a star-studded field to capture gold, the United States' only gold medal ever in this event. The Mills story is not only an athletic achievement, coverage in its entirety of the men's 10,000 meter final, an event dominated in recent years by runners from Africa. The United States has not won a medal in this event in four decades since the 1964 games in Tokyo. When Billy Mills, a Native American from South Dakota, stunned a star-studded field to capture gold, the United States' only gold medal ever in this event. The Mills story is not only an athletic achievement, but a personal triumph, which began on the impoverished Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, where fellow South Dakotan Tom Brokaw returned with Mills earlier this summer. He is an Oglala Sioux, the greatest warrior tribe of the Plains Indians, a tribe now struggling to find its place between a proud past and the demands of modern life, a people still trying to reconcile what's been lost. And for Billy Mills, raised on South Dakota's Pine Ridge Reservation, personal loss yeah. defined his young life. Tell me about the first thing you remember. The first thing I remember is actually probably not the first, but it's the most powerful. My mom died. I was fishing with my dad, and he just stroked my arm and gently said, you have broken wings, but I'll share something with you. And if you follow it, someday you'll have wings of an eagle. That led to the first book I remember reading with my dad. But one of the articles said, Olympians are chosen by the gods. No, no, I like that. Uh, not because of the significance of the Olympic Games, but I thought if I was chosen by the gods, I'd be able to see my mom again. Not long after that, Billy's father died, leaving Mills an orphan at the age of 12. Billy had a gift that took him first to a boarding school and then the University of Kansas. 
He could run fast and long, but never far enough to escape the turmoil of being an Indian in a white world in the 50s. Desperate, he contemplated suicide. He brought his doubts onto the track, and he battled his coach, Bill Easton. You're a track coach at the University of Kansas. You banged heads, right? <laughs> we had some very difficult conflicts, and yet at the same time, he, w he was a man of, of great honor. Uh, I would ask him, why, why aren't you addressing these racial issues? And he could not. He simply said to me, trust me, son, I can make you a great runner. So being orphaned, my trust was put in my emotional, my social, my psychological, my cultural existence in his lap. And, and he, he was too much on his plate. He wanted an athlete. I, I read somewhere where you dropped out of 40% of the races that you were involved in in college. Is that number true? Not 40%, 40% of the major races my senior year. Well, why were you having so much trouble finishing? It was, it was a defiance. It was almost in the sense that it's the only way I felt I could, I could get back at society was to, was to hurt some people that were trying to help me, the coach, University of Kansas. After graduation, Mills found personal peace in his marriage to Patricia Harris and a new discipline in the Marine Corps where he became an officer. The Marines encouraged him to continue his long distance running and his doubts and demons began to fade. He ran hard and trained hard, steadily, quietly improving his performance. He'd arrive at the Tokyo Olympics a changed man mentally and physically. The 1964 Olympic 10,000 meters, 6.2 miles of torture, had a loaded field, including Australian Ron Clark, the world record holder. Billy Mills of the United States had only raced this distance five times and never won. He wasn't a long shot. He had, by everyone's estimation, no shot. Now you're in the race. Was there ever a time when you thought, I can't complete this one? <laughs> I may have to drop out? Absolutely. We crossed the three mile within a second of my fastest individual three mile ever. And we had over three more miles to go. It is, I can't continue. I'm going to have to quit. Who do I focus on? I focused on my wife, Patricia. She's crying. You knew where she was? I, well, I didn't know. I knew she was as I came off one of the curves. I just wanted to make sure that she was not there. And she was. If she had not been there, who knows? And here we go with the final lap for the gold medal in the 10,000 meters. I come off the final curve, and I'm pushed. By Clark? By Clark. I closed back on his shoulder. Gamuti broke between us and I quit again. I was going to accept third place. Only, only recently did I have the strength to start without crying to say what I'm going to share with you. But my dad would say, you follow these various steps. Someday you'll have wings of an eagle. I come off the curve. The German runner looks and he sees me coming. We're laughing him. He moved out and he opened up a path. That in itself was inspiring, and I took off, going through the gap. As I go by him, I look, and in his singlet was an eagle. And it was, it was like wings of an eagle. And I can win, I can win, I can win. For the German runner, there was no eagle there. There was the Olympic circles. And it, it was as if it was meant to be. I come here, and I try to see in my mind's eye what it must have been like in 1860, 1850. When you come here, do you see crazy horse you see the great tribes the herds of bison I, I don't in a sense see it visually like that I hear I can look across now and I hear the beat of a drum and then the sacredness of the drum I, I can look and just looking at the pine trees I, I can see an image of crazy horse I can see the image of our, of our leaders of the past but but I think the beauty of it is I see our future and it's positive, and it's achieving, 
and is contributing to humanity. Today, Billy Mills okay. continues Thank to you. spread his wings Could you across queue up the next um, video for, uh, for me, please? Uh, just so that you um, know, uh, I actually, you saw the brief image of Crazy Horse. I actually um, hiked up there. It's just a phenomenal uh, experience. And I don't know if you, you got a sense of what he was saying. He thought he saw an eagle on the jersey of the guy behind him, but there was no eagle. But his father always told him about getting wings like eagles. And he is the only American ever to win a 10,000 meter goal. No American, and as a Native American. And, um, and I, I want to encourage us to think about, when I mention about belief, even when you don't believe in yourself, if you have somebody believing in you, it makes a lot of difference. Can we queue up and play the next video, please? And the next video, is, uh, hopefully we can see it, it's about Wilma Rudolph, who is another one of my idols, because Wilma Rudolph... In Tennessee, the 20th of 22 children, at age four... Welcome back to the games of the 28th Olympiad. I'm Jim Lampley. Coming up shortly... of the 28th Olympiad. I'm Jim Lampley. Coming up short. The one with Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph was one of America's first major national superstars in track. Wilma Rudolph was born on June 23rd, 1940 in Tennessee the 20th of 22 children. At age four, she contracted polio. Her doctors said she would never walk again, but with physical therapy, leg braces, and true grit, Wilma Rudolph was walking by age 12. During her high school years, Wilma Rudolph was a great basketball player, and Ed Temple from Tennessee State University saw her, and he saw a lot of potential, not only in basketball, but also in track. He had her work out with the college track team in the summers, at age 16, Wilma Rudolph won a bronze medal in the 1956 Melbourne Olympic Games for the 4x100 relay. Returning to the U.S., she attended Tennessee State University on a scholarship, where Ed Temple continued her training. Four years later in the Rome Olympics, along with Wilma, almost the entire U.S. track team consisted of Ed Temple's runners. She was phenomenal in the 1960 games in Rome. The two sprint events, she won in blowouts and she anchored the relay team that had to come from behind victory to win gold as well. Wilma Rudolph was the first American woman to win three gold medals in a single Olympics. She became an overnight sensation. Wilma Rudolph returned home from the Rome Olympics to a hero's welcome. When she learned that her ticker tape parade was to be segregated, she refused to attend and forced a change. Wilma Rudolph Day was the first integrated event in municipal history in the city of Clarksville, Tennessee. Wilma Rudolph was only 22 years old when she retired from competitive sports in 1962. She decided to go back to Tennessee State University and she got her degree in teaching and she became a teacher. Rudolph would go on to coach track at Indiana's DePaul University, serve as a goodwill ambassador to French West Africa, and raise a family of four children. Wilma Rudolph was inducted into the Black Athletes Hall of Fame in 1973, the National Track Hall of Fame in 1974, and she wrote her own autobiography titled Wilma, which was turned into a TV movie in 1977 called Wilma. Wilma Rudolph died of brain cancer at the age of 54 on November 12, 1994, in Nashville, Tennessee. One of the most prestigious awards in women's sports is the Wilma Rudolph Award of Courage, given by the Women's Sports Foundation. Wilma Rudolph is a huge inspiration to me and to many others, and really that is her legacy. Well, I hope that those two videos, uh, given the fact that you guys are in a country that really has uh, 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 
a phenomenal place in, in world history for athletics. You would appreciate that, uh, those videos. With Wilma Rudolph, one of the things that the video didn't talk about is that her mother always said that she was going to walk. And again, when I want you to think about this. Here is a woman afflicted with polio up until 12. And what, seven, eight years later, she's the fastest person in the world. I find just, just inspirational. And so I think sometimes we cannot give up hope. Yes, there was medical intervention, as they mentioned, the physiotherapy and all that, but the belief is, is so crucial. And, and for me, in wrapping up, I like to, from time to time, follow many of these stories. So I, I love athletics, I love sports, but I like to go behind the scenes and think about and understand why the success is the way it is. And in fact, here in Jamaica, one of the reasons is that one of your athletes, Arthur Wint, when he came back from the Olympics in the 40s, he said to the government, you must have a system. And most people don't know that. Because when you think about the rest of the Caribbean island, places like Bahamas, Trinidad, there are a lot of fast runners, but they do not have the pedigree and the success that Jamaica has. And it was really because of the vision of one guy, uh, Arthur Wint. You know, and so those are the stories that for me are encouraging because when you think about thinking and you go behind the scenes and you get to appreciate that they are always individuals, whether they be the Mother Teresa's, the Mandela's, etc., who are the, the Gandhi's, who are the ones who are movers and shakers, but they are allowing us the privilege to live the lives that we live in our own small world because they have dedicated their um, resources, their talents to making the world a better place. And I think we have an obligation to do a lot of that in our own world. So. Um, I want to thank uh, Andrea again for thinking of me and allowing me the privilege to, to communicate with you and I'll be happy to answer any questions either from the audience here or online. Thanks again. Very inspiring. Any questions from the audience or online? Yes, we have a question upstairs. I cannot accept to tell you that it's a difference in a protein. And so when it says RH negative, it just means that that individual doesn't have that protein. So as the slide says, 97% of individuals have the RH positive, the protein. So what it means is that when the baby, when the fetus is present, if the um, protein crosses the placenta, then the body takes it as a foreign protein and, build, and you build up resistance and you can cause a lot of uh, health issues to either the mother or the child. And so um, from that sense, I could say I, the, the, the biological uh, implications and the, all the cellular um, cascades I can't talk about, but just from a cursory point of view, it really is just a difference in the, f the, abs the absence or the presence of this protein. And um, if there's the blood mixes, then it's going to take it as a foreign substance, and then you're going to build up um, antibodies which will compromise the health of the individuals. Thank you for that question. Nobody has any questions? Oh, okay, Melissa. Uh, the, the question is about gene therapy. And again, what gene therapy is, is that you see when, for all our biological functions on a daily basis, they are enzymes that do various tasks. 
And so the gene is responsible for coding for those amino acids. And so what happens is that with the sickle cell anemia, as I mentioned, instead of glutamic acid, the gene puts in valine. And valine, because of the chemical structure, doesn't allow the hemoglobin to assume essentially a, a wrong shape that allows the iron to fit in. And it's the iron that is carrying the oxygen. Every time we breathe, it's picking up oxygen and taking the oxygen to the various cells. So what gene therapy does is they insert the right gene to make the right, um, to place the right amino acid in the right spot along that protein. Because remember I said that the primary structure is the, um, the order with which the amino acids must be placed. So like if you have a number one, two, three, four, five, if you place number five in the second position, then that is a different protein, for example. So what the gene does is go in and just replaces five in the second spot with the number two, if that makes sense. And so instead of having to um, have treatment, now individuals could have a cure where permanently now you would be rid of the sickle cell problem and then you wouldn't be passing that gene on because if you have two individuals who have sickle cells, then that child would be sickle. If you have a parent who has all the cells sickle and one that has a trait, then there's some you know, numbers that say, well, you can have a normal um, child or, 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 or one with a trait, etc. No, well, th that's the start. Again, what, what will happen is that this just gene therapy is new on the market, and so the FDA just approved this six months ago, I think, in the U.S., so there are like 47 patients who have already received this treatment. But I suspect that you'll have more of such therapies to cure diseases as opposed to treat them. But there's going to be a lot more knowledge that needs to take place. And as I alluded to with cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease, that's another um, where our, you know, you know, years ago we met a couple who, because that Huntington's disease is in their family, they decided they're not going to have kids because the odds are they would have passed on that gene. And so uh, they chose the, the route of adoption. And hopefully down the road, those individuals can be um, cured and not have to worry. Huntington's disease is a neurological disease where um, as you grow older, there's um, movement problems and motor um, conditions where you can't do certain things. Uh, in the right way, so it compromises your, your motor function and brain function. Cognitive processes, uh, how, how you might be thinking, etc. So, because again, it, it, this, I think the, the human being is complicated, but it's just so fascinating because so many things have to work in perfect order. And any sort of misstep, you know, allows things not to work properly. Um, you, know, you know, over the years, over the last five years, I've developed a condition where I've got to be on a blood thinner because I've developed a blood clot. And it turns out that with the clot, there are like six clotting factors, six proteins that are responsible. So when you get a cut, it's supposed to clot, but then that clot is supposed to dissolve. It, it, if it doesn't dissolve, then it will travel, and it could travel to the heart or, or the lung and have problems. So, and when the doctor did a lot of the tests, they suspect that there's a pro, uh, it's a genetic uh, malfunction where 
that particular protein is not working to its optimum thing. So I'm a, on a small amount of a blood thinner to um, prevent the blood clot. So, and again, if you know the truth, it sets you free because nowadays at least ways that you could um, treat and understand uh, the problem. So I think it's all good when, when you have a little bit of information that could translate into knowledge and then, um, and then make life a little easier. I saw there was a hand up there. No? Yes, ma'am. The question is um, if, if there's a difference between uh, the amino acids, but if you're a vegetarian or non-vegetarian. You know, they are like, I, I forget the number of essential amino acids. So the bottom line is that you have to uh, get these amino acids from the diet. The body might make some of them. So in most cases, I think as a person matures, they can choose to, once you have the knowledge, you, they can choose to change their diet, to, but compensate. And we know enough now where if we want to source all those essential amino acids from um, a vegetarian source, you can do that. So there isn't the same kind of risk as you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, because we know a lot more. And the, the food supply chain allows easier access to acquire those essential amino acids. I think um, the, for me the important thing is to make sure that as the child is being raised that you don't put them on some of those diets too early to make sure that they actually do get the, the relevant amino acids, essential amino acids that wouldn't compromise various um, health systems later on. Good questions, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The question is at what stage would you administer gene therapy? I'm not sure. My, so my supposition is that um, the the FDA, when, when these companies apply for the, the gene therapy, it would have been done on a certain population. And my guess is that the, po that population would be the more mature pop, uh, population. So people, let's say, in their 20s or 30s, um, who would probably would be eligible. And so just like with the COVID vaccine, it was um, developed for people above a certain age group. And then they started going back down to now what? over the last, what, three or four weeks, uh, children under five, between five and I think six months. So we have to do those um, epidemiological studies to be able to say, but my guess, I don't know specifically the age of um, the sickle cell patients, but I am um, suggesting that it's an older population because I did see uh, a program in the States and it was a, a, a girl who was in her it so he repeated it so everybody should get this right which amino acid like with sickle cell what is happening with respect to the amino acids why somebody gets sickle cell he mentioned it in the talk and a while ago so there is a substitution of a particular amino acid for another amino acid 
Does anybody remember the answer to that one? Which amino acid is substituted? So Sister Scott says what? Valine? All right, substitution of valine for which amino acid? It is substituted, valine is substituted for glutamic acid. Very good, very, very good. At least one person is paying attention. Right? <laughs> yes, so we're wrapping up. Um, we're going to have the vote of tanks by Sister Melissa, who is the vice president. But before that, you know, when you have questions, there's always some update to the scores. So Sister Marcia in the chat, she actually had 20 words from health. So Mar Sister Marcia, you know, is this probably champion. She's from Blue Diamond, so she, had, she made 20 words from health. Then Sister Mac and Sister Scott got 18. Sister Jasmine and Sister Melissa, 17. They're from Roses. Sister Smith, Janet Smith had 15, and she's from Lydia. So just to give an update. I just want to mention one thing. You can try this. Check if this one is working. Yes. One of the quotes in the box, um, I do want to at least mention where it says there are some questions that cannot be answered and there are some answers that cannot be questioned. And I heard that from a, a sermon once, and I think, again, it's a good um, set of words to think about because quite often sometimes when things happen to us, we always want to know why, why me, why this person. And sometimes there are no answers to those questions. And so you don't have to sweat it because it is what it is. It's life. Um, and then um, there are some questions um, you cannot um, question the answer. So when we think about, again, some of the facts that we know about the COVID vac uh, virus, etc., people who are going about saying things, they're just wrong. You, the answers are there and there's no ifs, ands, and buts. And so we just have to be... Uh, mindful of uh, when we're communicating, I feel that if we ask questions and we prompt people to say, well, why do you believe this? Tell me why. You're there. And it usually has consequences where the individual will then realize that they're, they're not making um, sense or they're not using the right um, conclusion based on the facts. And so... Um, I always encourage us to just ask questions, don't get into confrontations, but always think about thinking so that we can at, at least get the facts ourselves too, because sometimes we may not know everything, and I find that uh, very re reassuring. Dr. Garden, it certainly was a pleasure having you here with us this afternoon. And, be, and on behalf of the Women and Men's Fellowship of Portmore Gospel Assembly, we want to express our sincerest gratitude for having you here. It was so inspiring. We got a lot of information and it was motivational and truly it was a blessing having you here. And one of the things you, you said, you coined this phrase, thinking about thinking, and the fact that we are to believe. There are things that we are to believe, even if you don't believe in yourself. If you have somebody believing in you, it makes a lot of difference. That was what you said to us, and I will take home that. And we should believe in ourselves. And we want to thank you again for this afternoon. And thank you to everyone who came out this evening. Thank you to our online viewers. Um, truly, it was a success. And we want to thank you again and come again. <laughs> so on behalf of the Portmore Gospel Assembly, Men and Women's Fellowship, 
we want to present you with this small token of our appreciation. We hope you will enjoy everything in it. I see some Jamaican stuff in it, and I can see that you enjoy Jamaica, and I get the impression that you are not a Jamaican, and so we just hope you will enjoy this small token of our appreciation. So we're going to close in prayer. Thank you so much for coming to another informative session of Men and Women's Fellowship. So eternal Father and God, I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that we, for this time in your presence. Father God, we thank you for the men and the women's fellowship executive who continue to plan these informative sessions every month. Father God, we ask that you continue to give them guidance and vision so that we, they can impart in their special way to us. Father God, as we leave this sanctuary to our various places of abode, we ask that you will give us divine protection. And as we go into the work week, Father God, we know not what is there for us, but you know our future, Lord Jesus. And you at once, you're in the vessel, you smell at the storm. And we ask, Holy Father, that you give us guidance and protection throughout the week. Father God, we ask these and other blessings in your, no, no, no other name but your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you.
come alive.